it's just the best place on the planet to be if you want to enjoy your vacation uh, if you want to invest the business um, climate here in Antigua and Barbuda uh, is one of um, predictability and the currency has been stable over 40 years. Antigua and Barbuda is among the smaller countries of the Caribbean but the size of the islands shouldn't fool you. They're home to vibrant financial and tourism sectors. Despite a population of only 90,000, the country plays a key role as Antigua's airport is one of the busiest in the region, serving as the hub of the Eastern Caribbean. It's also a member of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, or OECS, a block of small countries bound together by the free movement of goods and people, as well as a common currency, the Eastern Caribbean dollar, which is one of the most stable currencies in the world. This trade partnership allows OECS members to have more clout together than they would individually within CARICOM, the Caribbean community. Antigua and Barbuda's GDP had grown consistently for over 30 years until the 2008 financial crisis, which hit it hard. The country's economy shrunk by 25% in the subsequent four years. However, since the new administration took place in 2014, GDP has grown at three times the regional average and has now returned to pre-crisis levels. So we recently sat down in the capital St. John's with Prime Minister Gaston Brown to discuss the country's current and future economic prospects. Prime Minister Brown, thank you so much for your time. An absolute pleasure. The Caribbean is an attractive destination for foreign direct investment, but there is intense competition among all of the players in the region to get increased foreign contribution. So in this context, what are the main advantages of Antigua and Barbuda uh, compared to the other countries in the region? You're absolutely right. Um, the Caribbean is certainly a very attractive area. Uh, we represent a zone of peace, and certainly most of the countries in the Caribbean enjoy political stability. So there are some common issues that we enjoy, but today Antigua and Barbuda is easily a more competitive country than the average country within the Caribbean region. We are far more responsive, far more aggressive in terms of attracting foreign direct investments and to stimulate domestic investments as well. Because we understand very clearly that um, investment, in essence, is the lifeblood of any country. Even larger societies, developed countries in the world, United States, Canada, United Kingdom, they are also competing for investments. So the truth is, the competition for investment is global. And it means, therefore, that we have to be more nimble, far more responsive in our approach, and to develop a, an investment regime that is far more attractive than in other countries. For example, we give corporate tax concessions up to 25 years. If, for instance, uh, someone is de developing a project here in Antigua and Barbuda, we invariably provide them with a uh, waiver on the duties, the taxes, and all of their capital equipment, building material, uh, just to make sure that we reduce the cost of the investment and at the same time to reduce the hurdle rate to ensure the viability and sustainability of the investment. So we understand very clearly that ultimately investments must be structured in such a way in which you have a win-win situation. One in which it creates opportunities for the locals and certainly for the investors to ensure that the project can generate sustainable profits. In some instances, we have partnered with both local and foreign investors. So for example, there are several hotel properties that have been constructed on the island. They are going through the planning phase right now, the design and the actual development of the drawings and so on, those are taking place presently. And we are partnering with uh, several of them in which we have actually made land available as part of our equity stake. With those type of creative mechanisms, we have been able to attract more investments in Antigua and Barbuda on a per capita basis than any other country within the Caribbean. In terms of the supporting infrastructure, certainly within the OECS region, uh, we easily have one of the best airports within the region. We're about to invest approximately 200 million US dollars to redevelop the cruise and the cargo ports, and also to make them the best within the Caribbean. So, very shortly, we will boast a superior infrastructure. And when it comes to human resource capacity, we are as good as any, and certainly better than many. We enjoy about a 99% literacy rate, which is comparable to those of um, developed countries. Our healthcare and our educational facilities, again, are just as good. We are very competitive. 
our government has actually spent a significant amount of um, funds to develop the healthcare sector. So in terms of uh, modern diagnostic equipment and so on, uh, Mount St. John today is easily the best equipped hospital within the OECS region, and we continue to expand it. And we also have a facility that was built to the tune of about uh, $60 million, which we intend to transform, or let's say to create a university for that matter. Okay. That's the Five Island um, facility. So we have been in negotiations with the University of the West Indies to establish their fourth campus here in Antigua and Barbuda to service students within the Caribbean and beyond. I believe um, within the next decade, Antigua and Barbuda will have one of the highest per capita uh, amount of individuals that would have had a tertiary education. Perhaps one of the differences too is that we are pursuing our development in an integrated way, taking into consideration all aspects of our development, the social, the economic, and even the environment. In fact, on the issue of the environment, uh, the commitment to climate change is perhaps exceptional compared to other countries in the Caribbean. Uh, so far, we would have committed over 100 million EC dollars to acquire solar and wind energy. And just yesterday, we signed an agreement with a U.S. firm to invest in 10 megs of um, geothermal energy. And the other area that we have concentrated on heavily uh, is the issue of crime and violence. In fact, um, today, Antigua and Barbuda is easily the safest country on the planet. I do not know any country that could boast um, homicides of less than five or five or less on an annual basis. So those are areas that when you look at them in a holistic way would have given Antigua and Barbuda a competitive edge compared to other countries. There may be other countries that may be superior to us in, in terms of performance in maybe a single sector. But in terms of consistent performance over all sectors, environment, education, healthcare, infrastructure, is no other country within the Caribbean can boast that type of holistic development, and especially in, within such a short period of time. Since the aftermath of 2008, the country has been enjoying a healthy economic growth. In fact, uh, especially since you took office, according to the IMF World Economic Outlook, GDP grew by 3.2% in Antigua and Barbuda in 2014, and by 3.9% in 2015, which is three times the regional average. So what do you attribute this rapid growth to, and what does it mean for the future of the economy? Well, we've kept it very simple. And for us, we recognize that in order to get a competitive advantage, there are several things that we had to do. First of all, getting the focus right. And we recognize that we had to concentrate on attracting a significant amount of foreign direct investments because the capital formation within the country is so small that in order to sustain robust economic growth and development, we must have a sustaining pool of investments coming into the country. The other push was to bring more tourists to the country. Initially, when we came to office two years ago, we were advised by the various stakeholders, to include the Antigua Hotel Association, that there would have been about a 12% decline in the amount of tourists coming to the country. And we had to move quickly last year in order to literally recover the reduction in the first half of um, 2015, which ordinarily would have been better than the second half. So that by the end of 2015, we literally exceeded the amounts that um, the amount of tourists who came to the country in 2014. Uh, even in terms of the infrastructure, as we speak, we're presently expanding the heritage keep here and uh, we're also dredging so that by the end of this season, we'll be able to attract the quantum class ships. In addition, we'll be building an additional pier, which will be able to accommodate the Oasis class ships, which in itself then will give us a competitive advantage above and beyond others who do not have the capacity to attract those ships. So for us, strategically, we have been projectizing our development. We do not believe in these long-term plans or with these eco econometric models and you know, and I'm not saying that long-term planning is not important, but you'd recognize that um, in order to achieve strategic advantage, then you have to be able to move pretty quickly. Governments do not generally move quickly, and that in itself has become 
his strategic advantage, Fantigan Barbuda. And we've been able to move quicker than the average government in the sense that we have demystified the planning process. So you came into office in 2014 after 10 years of Baldwin Spencer's governance. Correct. Your main objectives were to put the nation back to work, to fight crime, which you mentioned, uh, to rebuild the economy and make Antigua and Barbuda an economic powerhouse in the Eastern Caribbean. Exactly. So you mentioned the reduction in crime as one of your major most success. significant achievements. What are your main priorities moving forward? Well, as you also confirmed, uh, we have restored growth to the country. Between 2009 and 2011, uh, under the former administration, the country lost 25% of its GDP. I mean, the country's economy was decimated. So it was really heavy lifting in order to stabilize the country in the first instance. I mean, we cannot resolve those issues overnight. It takes some time, but we're moving in the right direction. And it would have been the growth that we experienced during the past um, two years that would have ensured that people, well, first of all, expansion of the economy, uh, government's revenues would have increased, uh, more activities in the private sector, uh, more job creation to the extent that we have created about 3,000 jobs between the public and the private sectors within two years. And that in itself would have created uh, a serious dent in the, in, in the, in the amount of um, unemployment within the country. So putting people to work was definitely a priority of my government and will be a priority until it is fully resolved. Uh, and, and I have no doubt that within the next 18 months, we should be at a level of full employment based on the number of projects that will come and stream, I'd say within two years for sure. So well before the next general elections, um, we should be really at a stage where we can say that, look, um, not only have we stabilized the country's economy, but we have reduced taxes. In fact, um, we just eliminated personal income tax. And that is why we said to less taxes, more investments, more jobs. Even now we're uh, transitioning into a green climate smart economy that is taking place. We had set a target to have at least a 20% reduction in our carbon footprint by 2019. And I'm absolutely confident that that will be exceeded. So if you look at it in the context of what we inherited, when we came to office in 2014, there was late payment in salaries and wages. Social security payments were late. Several of our loans were delinquent. In fact, at least 30% of the country's loan stock was delinquent. It's so only since we came to office that we brought the loan up to date and we have been paying since. I mean, we've been working very hard for the advancement of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, we continue to prioritize the economic development of the country, while at the same time ensuring that the social aspects are not left behind. I just told you about the investments in education and healthcare, and at the same time to increase government's revenues so that we can take care of our obligations. Because for us, the credibility of the country is very important. Tourism, speaking of employment, is the main driver of the economy with 60% of GDP, more than half the jobs in the country, 40% right. of investment. You've made specific efforts since you came into office to diversify sources of tourism and of investment in tourism. Right. Thinking of the special economic zone like the Yida development, right. thinking of the new deal that you recently signed with the United Arab Emirates, right. an increased number of airlines yeah, serving the country. Absolutely. Could you elaborate on some of these projects and tell us about your long-term vision for tourism in Antigua and Barbuda? Well, tourism will continue to be the main drive of the country's economy for a very long time. It's an area in which we have significant um, experience, an area in which we are competitive. Uh, in fact, I will go as far as saying that Antigua and Barbuda is easily the best place for tourism on the planet. I mean, when you look at the, the climate, uh, you have, for example, an average temperatures of about 26, 27 degrees Celsius, which is just beautiful for outdoor living. We boast 365 beaches, and each of our beach could stand out as one of the best beaches in the world. And several of our beaches have been voted the best beaches in the world. And um, you have this constant um, you know, prevailing sea breeze keeping the country cool. I mean, you're breathing clean, fresh air. You go to the beach, we have a number of areas that are pristine, unspoiled. Uh, so those are attributes that really lend to good, a good quality of life, which should be and is and has been uh, an attraction for investors and for tourists alike. It's just the best place on the planet to be if you want to enjoy a vacation, uh, if you want to uh, invest, 
I mean, the business um, climate here in Antigua and Barbuda uh, is one of um, predictability. Uh, you know, we're part of, an, of the OECS Currency Union, and the currency has been stable from since we've had this union over 40 years. In addition to that, um, in, even in terms of governance, um, whenever there's a change of government, um, there's no instability, there's a smooth transition. And um, barring the former failed experiment, uh, we, ha we have been accustomed to consistent economic growth. I mean, real estate prices here, for example, have been very consistent, which means too that investment in real estate uh, would provide investors with a steady, uh, sustaining increase without the type of risk and volatility that they will um, experience on, on, on a stock market. Uh, we have had a number of large investments. You spoke about the Yida Group. Uh, in fact, we have partnered with them to create a special economic zone. Uh, but the Act provides for us to partner with other investors to create special economic zones in which they could operate as though they are offshore and they would not have um, any tax liabilities. We even um, have the facilities in which they can have their own customs uh, satellite office just to ensure the seamless movement of um, goods in and out of the country. And we continue to look at the whole issue of doing business within the country to ensure that it is um, you know, one of the best countries within which to do business. Uh, the World Bank has acknowledged that my government um, has made a significant amount of changes but as they said, they have to allow for some time to see exactly how they work. And then within the near future, we will see, I believe, what will be a dramatic increase in the doing business ranking of Antigua and Barbuda. But on the other hand, speaking of doing business, Antigua and Barbuda has a very small workforce of it with the population of 90,000 people. Right. It has no natural resources to speak of, and it has very strong competition on banking and financial services in the region. So in that context, what are the specific sectors of the economy that you think show the most potential to grow and diversify the economy as, as is one, year, one of your main right. goals? And I do accept that we, we have a relatively small um, economy, a small country in terms of its uh, population base. But interestingly, we are part of uh, an OECS economic union. We are also part of the CARICOM community, which gives us a pool of labor uh, to the extent uh, today uh, at least 50% of our um, po country's population, uh, I'd say, comprises of immigrants. Uh, to the extent Antigua and Barbuda today is a melting pot. And it, that in itself is a strength, uh, in the sense that as we continue to attract investors to the country, uh, our people are very embracing of individuals of different nationalities and ethnicities, so they do not have to worry about any form of discrimination. But Again, in terms of diversification and other sectors for growth, uh, the offshore sector is uh, certainly um, one such sector, the offshore financial services sector. It's an area that we continue to uh, seek to develop. I have to admit that we have had some difficulties. Uh, in fact, the most recent and perhaps what is clearly an exist existential threat now for um, the country is the issue of de-risking, in which it has become difficult now for some of these banks to maintain the corresponding banking relations. Uh, but it's an area in which we have um, significant experience and skills as well, an area, an area in which we have been able to compete globally. But the politics of it is that um, when these um, offshore um, sectors grow too soon and too large, then there's almost this knee-jerk reaction that um, all offshore sectors and all offshore banks are to facilitate money laundering or tax evasion, and in many instances, wrongfully so. I mean, we have argued that in the case of Antigua and Barbuda, I mean, we only have about two billion US dollars in assets. And uh, when you look at it in terms of the global value of offshore financial services office uh, assets, they're in the trillions. So you're talking about what, less than 0.01%, which is just insignificant, but yet still, the OECD countries, um, especially the United States, um, they continue to um, have the INSA reports and different reports in which they cite us for money laundering without any tangible evidence of it happening. In fact, um, the truth is, I mean, whereas they cite Antigua and Barbuda and other countries in the Caribbean to be tax havens, the biggest tax haven in the world is the United States. I mean, they have Wyoming, they have Delaware, 
Nevada, all those states that continue to um, facilitate, I would say, a number of um, activities in the offshore sector that we have outlawed many years ago. So the sector has some challenges, and uh, they're probably maybe geopolitical challenges, but we continue nonetheless to press into expanding the sector to achieve a form of um, economic diversification. An area that we have actually um, ventured into three years ago, started by the Farm Administration, is an area of CIP. That is um, Citizenship by um, Investment um, Program, in which we are seeking to attract high net worth individuals to help us to invest in different sectors of the country's economy, uh, to include not only tourism, but um, to include the offshore financial services sector in manufacturing, agriculture, etc. And at the same time, to, to uh, get a cadre of uh, individuals who have skills that can translate to the country to further improve our competitiveness. That too, incidentally, has created some concerns, um, not necessarily real, uh, by some of these OECD countries again. So I have to admit, our efforts to diversify, especially in services, has been met with some difficulties. You may be aware too that some years ago, under a previous Labour Party administration, we had diversified into uh, gaming. And at one point, the country had a very thriving gaming industry. And the US decided to criminalize the operators, many of whom were citizens of the United States, to the extent that the industry was totally decimated. So whereas they're providing about three, 4,000 jobs at a time, today, I do not think we, that the industry or the sector uh, provides as much as 300 jobs. So the former Labour Party administration had taken the US to, to the WTO, and we won the case. But unfortunately, 13 years after the fact, the matter remains outstanding, to the extent that we have now decided to up the ante. Uh, the WTO provides us with the legal right to suspend U.S. intellectual property until we recover the amount outstanding, which is now in the region of 200 million U.S. dollars. We have tried to resolve the issue through diplomacy, but unfortunately, we have not made much progress. I mean, the offer that they have um, extended to us is paltry, and uh, we are going through perhaps a final iteration of negotiations later this month. If that fails, then clearly we'll have to up the ante, go to Parliament and pass the necessary legislation to suspend the intellectual property rights of U.S. artists, U.S. corporations. Uh, so it's a very serious issue. So uh, there, there are very few areas in which we could truly diversify the country's economy. As you said, small. We don't have a lot of options. I mean, some people speak to about the issue of diversifying into agriculture, manufacturing. I mean, countries that rely on agriculture, they're very poor. They have lower per capita incomes. So for us, agriculture is important from the standpoint of feeding ourselves, or from the standpoint of food security. But in terms of the export potential of agriculture, it's basically non-existent in the sense that, one, we suffer from consistent droughts. In fact, for the last three years, we have had less than 30 inches of rain annually last three years, we have had extreme droughts to the extent that we have had to invest in two additional arrow plants, reverse osmosis plants, within the last um, year. We installed one in February, and we bought another one that will be installed probably about October, November of this year, in order to ensure that we are fully sustainable uh, based on our capacity to produce reverse osmosis water. And, and that is very expensive. I mean, reverse osmosis water is about six times more expensive than, um, you know, fresh water, groundwater, rainwater. Uh, so uh, these are some of the challenges that we're faced with. And, uh, you know, in terms of any diversification into agriculture, clearly it will cost us far more to produce a tomato here than to produce one in the U.S. and to ship it here. The similar strategy for manufacturing to produce whatever we can in order to satisfy domestic um, demand. But the export capability is very limited. You entered the political arena 17 years ago. And before then, your background was in banking. How has your experience in the private sector influenced your style of governance? It has, because I mean, I have a very pragmatic um, approach to governance. It's what works for us, a very business-like approach. 
and issues of efficiency and productivity and so on are very important. I mean, those are values that I would have brought from the private sector into the public sector. And as I speak to senior public servants, we continue to drive these values so that they understand that they're important to support that vision of creating an economic powerhouse. And I've said to them too that the creation of this vision, it's not a cliche. I mean, it's the vision to drive the strategy because we believe that vision drives strategy. If you don't have a vision, then you don't know what you're working towards. And then having the strategy, we then develop programs and projects, discrete projects, so that we can manage them and that we can see how we can achieve you know, competitive advantage compared to, to, to the others. So it also helped me to introduce a more competitive spirit within the public sector because, I mean, I worked within a, an overbanked sector and survival was based primarily on the ability to attract business. So whereas other traditional bankers were sitting in the offices waiting for business to come to them, I was out there trying to attract customers to my bank at the time. So taking over the governance of this country, rather than waiting for investors to come to the country, I would travel to meet them. And we've been very open. So for example, investor can literally walk off of, of a plane on a given day and walk into my office. And we make it very simple. You know, the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. And um, it is that type of conditioning in, within the private sector that would have helped to fashion the governance that I would have, or the style of governance that I would have brought into, uh, in, in, into the governance of the country, or the type of leadership I would have brought into the governance of the country. Uh, so for example, I would say that um, our leadership is one of entrepreneurship. Uh, for example, I mean, we have come up with the whole issue of entrepreneurial governance. And uh, that in itself, even though, as I said, sounds um, philosophical, it's not a social philosophy about socialism. It's really about um, ensuring that we provide opportunities for all, but to ensure that the excesses that exist typically within capital structures, where you may have, for example, 10% uh, of the population enjoying maybe 80% of the wealth. Income inequality. Income inequality. Uh, in fact, um, I would say that we found that Antigua and Barbuda had a very high GI and I, um, Gini coefficient, meaning that the um, incomes here were very skewed in favor of the wealthier ones. So we had to come with a construct that will ensure that we do not further skew the wealth distribution within the country. And what entrepreneurial socialism does is that it actually curbs the excesses of private enterprise by ensuring that some of the profits are further socialized, not only through taxation, but through the payment of dividends to the government of Antigua and Barbuda for the benefit of the masses. And I give you a practical example. Uh, we invested, for example, in the West Indies Oil Company which was previously controlled by a private um, entity. And uh, by having 51% of the shares today, uh, the company makes about $20 million a year in profits. Rather than having the $20 million, uh, the, uh, let's say exclusively private shareholders, maybe a handful or even a single private um, shareholder having a call on $20 million in profits, today 51% of that, we have a call and 51% of that. Now, we had a dividend policy of about, uh, I think it was 67% uh, this year. So of the $20 million in profits that they made, about um, $7 million of that will go into, a, into the consolidated fund to fund things like healthcare, education, etc. So the masses will benefit. Because you see, when you have a single person or a group of individuals in the private sector benefiting from abnormal profits, then they become profligate and um, it doesn't help the development of a country. And in many instances, they have so much money, they bank it overseas, stash it away, so you, you do not have the funds being you know, reinvested into the country. So for us, it's not a, a socialist philosophy. It's about the government making private sector interventions, partnering with private groups to invest. Uh, in fact, where you have failure as well, um, any failed institution, a hotel, a bank, etc., the government will take in. 
or rather than put it in public funds and then turn it over to the private sector to make all of the funds, all of the monies, all the profits, we'll take an equity stake to ensure that some of those profits come back to the government for the development of the masses. As a conclusion to this interview, do you have a message for the viewers, for the readers, uh, about Antigua and Barbuda, about your administration, and about the future of the country? Well, it's easily, I'd say, the best country uh, within the Caribbean to invest at this time. And uh, investors who are looking for responsiveness, they're looking for a government that will support the initiative, understanding that um, they must make profits to sustain themselves, and we have no difficulties um, maintaining and enhancing that environment for profitability. Uh, that Antigua and, and Barbuda, our government, is the government that will support that type of initiative. Uh, also to, I mean, invite them as well to live in Antigua and Barbuda, if not permanently, at least, to become residents of Antigua and Barbuda. Um, they could become citizens of Antigua and Barbuda through our CIP program. And uh, that program requires a contribution to the NDF program, the National Development Fund of about 250,000 US. Or they could purchase real estate of about 400,000 US dollars. And I think they pay another $50,000 in fees and become eligible for Antiguan citizenship. Uh, so that is certainly one of the areas in which I would like to um, interest them. And there are also many unexploited and unexploited opportunities within the country in which investors um, could capitalize upon. Uh, for example, within the manufacturing sector, within agriculture, in fact, generally speaking, we import 90% of what we consume. And it means that the opportunities to manufacture different products, uh, there, there's an opportunity, for example, um, in, in, in farming to probably have a chicken farm here in Antigua and Barbuda to supply Antigua and Barbudans. I believe we, we, we import about 25 million US dollars annually worth of chicken. That's an area in which an investor could look at. We're now trying to diversify the country's in, uh, industry into or the country's economy into aqua farming. Um, I understand that uh, Lockheed Martin, that they have a technology in which you can literally do aqua farming within the ocean. And we are trying to attract investors. They could invest, for example, in our CIP program, become citizens, and at the same time become owners of businesses. And there are many, as I said, unexploited and unexploited opportunities that they can definitely capitalize upon. And again, in terms of supporting the investments, uh, we have um, investor production agreements with several states. We also have um, double taxation agreements, and generally speaking, our constitution. I mean, our whole legal system is based on um, the British jurisprudence. So property rights and so on are protected by the constitution of our country. So there is no possibility of you know their assets being nationalized or their businesses being nationalized. Uh, they can be assured that they can operate in a well-run country. And, and one thing I didn't get a chance to mention earlier, Antigua and Barbuda consistently today has been voted one of the most, our government, one of the most transparent governments in the world. And a great climate, uh, very low levels of crime and violence, the lowest of any country in the world. A vibrant economy, one that continues to expand. So again, I take this opportunity to welcome visitors to come to the country to enjoy the hospitality, which is certainly superior to all in the Caribbean, and at the same time to invest, in, to invite investors to invest in our country. Prime Minister Brown, we look forward to seeing the country continue its development. Thank you very Pleasure. much. Thank you very much. Thank you.